morning. This is the Vermont House Human Services Committee, and it is Wednesday, January 5th, and we are starting our um, sort of budget um, adjustment testimony, um, as well as a testimony around um, what, what, what's happening in various departments as it relates to um, the pandemic and how that has happened. So we're starting off um, today with the um, Deputy Commissioner um, Kelly Dougherty from the, uh, um, the um, from the Department of Health. And Kelly, um, Deputy Commissioner, apologize, I'm trying to be more serious. Um, Happy New Year and um, please go ahead. I don't know if you have anything written for us um, that we should, um, either you or um, can pull up or Julie can. I don't have a formal presentation, but I do have some remarks that okay. I can start out with. Okay. So good morning, everyone. I believe that I've met all of you before. Again, I'm Kelly Dougherty and I'm Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Health and welcome back. Uh, and thank you for allowing me to address you all today. Uh, as you probably are well aware, we've been addressing two epidemics um, over the last couple of years, not only the COVID-19 pandemic, but um, uh, an epidemic of opioid overdoses. As you are probably aware, we've seen an increase um, since pre-COVID era. And I want to assure this committee, as well as all Vermonters, that the Department of Health even throughout the COVID-19 response has never uh, taken its eye off the ball, so to speak, with respect to addressing substance use issues. Um, we, on the contrary, have actually stepped up a lot of our overdose prevention activities during COVID-19, as we saw um, overdoses and deaths rise. Um, and this is even with, um, you know, many of our staff at the health department being deployed to COVID-19 activities. Um, but with respect to the staff who are working on substance use issues, um, although many of them were deployed, it was for partial effort, uh, meaning not full time, so that they could continue with their other um, regular duties. And it was time limited and ADAP was able to be pretty strategic with respect to how they use their staff resources so that uh, we were able to keep up our efforts with substance use, addressing substance use. Um, a hundred percent of treatment providers remained open and available during COVID-19. So we didn't see um, treatment services with the exception of um, when there were outbreaks in residential facilities that um, you know, prevented admissions. Um, treatment providers remained open and available and there were some relaxation of the medication assisted treatment rules that allowed flexibility with respect to uh, people being able to receive their uh, methadone um, in more flexible ways that allowed continuity of care for treating opioid use disorder. And our recovery centers quickly pivoted to online services during the lockdown. And although it's not ideal because the connection, the personal connection with other people is so important for people in recovery and um, struggling with substance use, but they were able to um, do some outreach and stay in touch with uh, at-risk clients and maintain connection with um, recovery supports. But like I said, um, you know, our overdoses, as with everywhere else in the country, have increased. Um, and we saw a record number of overdose deaths in 2020. And unfortunately, 2021 is not looking better. Um, and like I said, it's a national problem. We're seeing an increase in methamphetamine in overdoses. We're not sure if um, methamphetamine, we're seeing um, overdose deaths involving methamphetamine that also has fentanyl in it. So we don't know if people are intentionally using these things together or whether people are using methamphetamine and not knowing that it's laced with fentanyl. 
We're also seeing, um, it's not huge, but there's been um, some use of xylazine, which is a, a veterinary drug that is used as a sedative for horses and other non-human mammals. And we're seeing that start to show up. Um, and we're just seeing uh, very, very potent uh, substances in the drug supply. So far this year, 100% of our overdose deaths involve fentanyl. So um, it's a huge problem. And, um, you know, our ADAP director, Cindy Seabright, sits on a lot of national uh, committees and, you know, is in a lot of contact with her counterparts in other states. And I can assure you that um, there is not one evidence-based initiative um, that we're not doing here in Vermont. You know, we're really trying to do everything we can to address um, overdoses. The other thing I'd just like to point out is that we don't know how many of our opioid overdoses, uh, overdose deaths are suicides. Um, in the absence of, you know, a note or something like that, uh, you know, we just don't have that information. And, and I think we all know that the COVID-19 pandemic has really impacted people's mental health. So, um, you know, a lot of anxiety, depression, and so we're just not sure how many are suicides. Um, so I can pause for questions or I can just sort of run through some of the overdose prevention initiatives that uh, we're undertaking and some that we've expanded during the pandemic. Should I continue? Um, Deputy Commissioner, I'm doing a quick look uh, to see if someone has a question right now or whether we want to have you go um, forward. Um, I think I think we're we're good with your going um, forward with some more discussion in terms of that. Um, I might ask a of course I'm, I have a question before you start. Yeah, um, just to for, for sort of level setting. You were talking about how staff were deployed. Mm -hmm. um, but not deployed full time. So, oh, um, and actually we have another question too. I, um, but um, in terms of being the staff deployed, are they all back full time in the jobs that they were hired to do? Or are there staff that are still um, doing, um, in, in what job description languages, other duties as assigned? <laughs> There are still staff who are doing um, COVID related work. So if you could, um, if you don't have it now, um, if you could please um, provide us with um, a list, not of the names, but of the positions um, and their role and how much they are um, being deployed to do something else. That would be, I think, very helpful. And are you asking just for the Division of Alcohol and Drug Programs? Um, at this point, for, for, for um, yes, but to be honest, um, um, we are interested in, um, or I am very interested, and in, I think I speak for the committee, um, it, uh, what are the personnel resources that are being deployed? Um, because I am, uh, the health department has been doing yeoman's work, and I'm concerned with what is their ongoing work and how that is being um, mm -hmm. impacted, if not the work on the staff yeah. doing double duty. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I seem to have opened up the floodgates, Representative Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Deputy Commissioner, um, if maybe when you're going through the, the list of resources and uh, tactics that you're deploying, if you could um, update us on the on whether the the ER uh, hospital uh, quick response referral um, is if that's still in place in all the hospitals. I know it had expanded. Mm -hmm. um, and if you could also tell us about um, if there are any um, special targeted outreach to um, folks in more rural places, given that. Um, 
places like Lamoille County having, you know, the, the highest rates of um, overdoses. And um, also we saw a, a unfortunately, a, a, a big chunk of folks leaving the Women's Correctional Center last year um, who um, died of overdoses as, as they left and whether or not there's any special outreach and uh, coordinated planning with um, releases from the correctional facility. And then the $12 million that uh, uh, Senator Leahy uh, secured for Vermont and um, how that is impacting our, um, our response. How is that bolstering up what mm -hmm. we're able to do? That would be great. Um, <clears throat> I don't see any more questions. What I would um, um, encourage um, the members of the committee, uh, as we have questions, um, why don't we write them down and let uh, the deputy commissioner sort of begin to outline some of the um, initiatives that they have taken. Um, and then um, we'll have that ground to work from. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so some of the things that we have been um, overdose response activities that many of which were in place before but were enhanced during COVID-19. Uh, one of the biggest ones and one of the most important ones is naloxone distribution or Narcan. So we really stepped up our Narcan distribution um, and EMS uh, now carries Narcan and they will uh, are required to leave it at the scene when, um, when they uh, respond to an overdose um, or even if they you know, suspect that there may be um, drug use happening. So they're leaving the naloxone at the scene. Um, we are distributing what we call harm reduction packs which are, you know, include Narcan, include fentanyl test strips, include um, uh, some supplies, some um, uh, resources, written resources on how to access treatment. We're distributing those far and wide, um, including to the general assistance motels, to social service agencies um, all over the state so that uh, people have those resources available to them. Uh, we have some first responder cards that we developed that um, first responders carry that they can leave with people that um, are just quick and easy resource cards for people to access services. We've expanded uh, the syringe service programs have expanded their mobile services. So now all of the syringe service programs in the state um, offer mobile services so that people can uh, not only get supplies so that they, you know, if they're using can use safely, but also it's a connection um, and a, a support that can connect them to treatment. Um, uh, um, Deputy Commissioner, I'm mm -hmm. realizing, I'm, I'm, I'm realizing as you go through these, that maybe it makes sense that as you talk about each initiative, that you take a breath. <laughs> and we see if, you know, and then we see if there are questions related to that yeah. initiative, okay. and then we move on to the next one. Um, and uh, if I may start with the um, Narcan and Naloxone, mm -hmm. you said it's being distributed to all EMS. So these are the um, volunteer ones, as well as the EMS that are attached to um, fire departments. Correct. And are they being distributed for free? Yes. Or, okay. Um, and the harm reduction packs that you're mailing out, are you mailing, where are you mailing them out and in what languages? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so um, there are 74 sites around the state that distribute the harm reduction packs. So, um, the syringe service programs distribute them, hospitals, police departments. We, uh, we have them out in the probation and parole offices, uh, women's shelters, shelters for those experiencing homelessness, treatment and recovery facilities. Like I said, the general assistance motels. 
Um, and they include, like I said, uh, Narcan, um, uh, informational materials about 211 and about um, safe, in, safe injection practices, uh, sanitizer, face masks, um, uh, a mouth barrier for rescue breathing so that if someone does overdose, they can um, safely uh, provide them with mouth to mouth if necessary. Um, hep C information, fentanyl test strips. I do not know how many languages the materials are in, but I can certainly find that out and, uh, and let you know. I would imagine that we have translated materials, but I, I just want to double check that. Because oh, um, I would, I think that would be important and I don't know mm -hmm. um, in terms of your information and data in terms of uh, where um, or who is overdosing and um, whether um, there are particular populations, um, communities of color, new Americans, um, uh, other, um, other groups and how we are targeting them. Um, I'm also curious, and this will age me, um, a long, long time ago, the health department had a wonderful initiative around AIDS and they put material in bars and they put wonderful posters in bars. And I'm wondering if any of the harm reduction packs are available in, um, have you made them available to places where um, people may party? You know, I don't believe so, but let me, again, I will double check that. Uh, um, does anyone else have questions about the Narcan? <laughs> Um, the second one you were talking Madam about Chair. was. Madam Chair, I do. I just can't get my hand up. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Representative McFawn. Uh, I, I, I just have a question. I, I'm sitting here listening to all of these good things that we're doing. And I'm saying to myself, uh, this is maybe kind of a weird question, but um, how do we ensure that we're not supporting a drug culture? Well, the, do you mean by providing um, safe I'm not injection? against everything that you've talked about, mm -hmm. but, but it's, it seems like, um, <laughs> anyway, I've got to leave my question there. I, I don't even know if you can answer it, but through my mind, I said, man, we're, it's like we're supporting this, you know, in the, in the motels and there, are all these people just success? They're, they're all, not all of them, but are they, they're, um, they're addicts. I'm, I'm trying to figure out, um, there's got to be a line <clears throat> between providing help and assistance and counseling and all that kind of stuff to help people out and then just flooding the place with everything uh, except the drug itself. All right. Well, there's um, so the harm reduction services, if you think about opioid uh, addiction as an illness and as something that, um, you know, people don't have control over. So the, the idea behind harm reduction is that which is providing safe supplies is you really want to one prevent people from uh, disease. So by providing safe injection supplies, you are addressing um, hepatitis C, HIV, and other bloodborne diseases that people can get if they're sharing supplies. So you, you wanna try to prevent that. If people are using, um, it's important that they have access to those supplies. Uh, the other point is that, um, Naloxone is a life-saving drug and it um, basically can stop, it will stop an overdose in its tracks. Um, and because of the proliferation of fentanyl in the drug supply, which is so incredibly powerful and dangerous, um, we wanna try to prevent people from dying if they are using drugs. And I'm 
consciously saying, I'm consciously not saying if people choose to use drugs because it does, it be, it is not a choice. Once someone is addicted, it is, um, if they don't use, they become very ill. And so the other point I'd like to make is that, um, providing harm reduction services through like syringe service programs is a point of connection for people to access treatment. And we've seen this, um, you may be familiar with uh, the Howard Center Safe Recovery Program in Burlington, where it, it used to just be a syringe service program, but then they brought in providers who um, provide medication assisted treatment, buprenorphine. And so people coming to safe recovery to get Narcan, to get fentanyl test strips, to get um, safe injection supplies, it's a safe place for them where they feel comfortable and where they feel welcomed. And so when they are ready to access treatment, it is available right there. And that is actually a program that we're expanding across the state to embed treatment services in syringe service providers, because we know that it's a place where people feel safe and welcome and respected. And so the ultimate goal is to connect people with services. Yeah, that's, that's I, mm -hmm. I realize that. Um, I, I just have one more uh, mm -hmm. thought. Um, fentanyl. Um, I, I know that the governor every week has a conversation with other governors and the president. Now, fentanyl is one of those drugs that at least if you listen to the news um, that comes across the border. Has that, to, to your knowledge, and I don't know whether you attend the cabinet meetings or not, but do you know of any efforts that are being made to stop that? Yeah, I mean, it's a- it's a All over the place. It is, and um, and some of it comes from overseas. Some of it comes, you know, a, across our borders from, you know, the, the southern, you know, from Central America. Um, and you know, there is the uh, the DEA and the high intensity drug trafficking um, entity that really keeps an eye on that. But it's it's just very difficult to. Uh, control. So I don't know specifically if that's something that the governor has talked with um, other governors and the president about. Um, but certainly I know that law enforcement is, you know, really doing as much as they can to try to stop drug trafficking. Um, but it's really challenging. Thank you. Thank you, um, Deputy Commissioner. Um, the other, um, as we move to the other initiative um, that you were talking about, expand. you said we expanded the uh, syringe programs and they all offer mobile, um, mobiles. They're, all, they're all mobile now as well. Yes. Um, can you, would you refresh our memory um, as to where in fact are the syringe exchange programs? Mm -hmm. and, Yes. Yeah, so um, we actually lost a couple of physical locations um, over since before the pandemic. Um, some of them have closed, but they've replaced their physical, you know, brick and mortar location with mobile. Um, but they are, I'm going to just pull up. There is a list of them on our website. Um, if you go to um, uh, our treatment page, it will list where all of the uh, syringe service programs are. I don't know all of them off the top of my head, but I know that we've got one in Burlington. Um, well, we've got a couple in Burlington. We've got Vermont Cares and we have uh, Safe Recovery. Um, there's Rutland, the Brattleboro location uh, went completely mobile. There's mobile services through Vermont Cares through the Northeast Kingdom. And then I believe there is a physical location in Springfield, but I can send a link to where you can find all of those physical locations 
um, uh, after the meeting today. Um, thank you. And we mm -hmm. see we have another question related to this from Representative Small. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Deputy Commissioner, for coming mm -hmm. in today. Um, and talking about expanding access to syringe service programs, I know statute currently limits the organizations that are able to provide uh, syringe service programs to aid service organizations, mm -hmm. and abuse treatment providers, and healthcare providers. Uh, and thinking about expanding mobilization, have you also thought about expanding to community-based organizations or other areas where folks are working directly with uh, those at the highest risk? Yeah, I think that as much as we could expand would be wonderful. Um, I think that the mobile services helps because, you know, they travel through communities and so it's not limited to necessarily this specific brick and mortar location. But I think that being able to expand that would certainly be something that we would be interested in looking at. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Deputy Commissioner, I think you can go on. Okay, great. Um, so uh, we also um, have expanded our overdose messaging campaigns. So someone had said something, I believe it was Representative Wood, about sort of how we're reaching um, particularly rural communities. So right now we have a media campaign that is called No OD, K-N-O-W-O-D. And it's targeted to um, to people who are at risk, so and their their loved ones. So you may not have seen this messaging because it's you know social marketing that's targeted to you know specific demographics, but it um, is an overdose awareness campaign that um, gives uh, overdose prevention tips and also information on harm reduction. So. Um, really targeted to sort of get the word out that, you know, here's what you need to do to try to prevent overdose. Um, any questions about that before I move on? Um, Deputy Commissioner, you said this was, the um, initiative was directed to at-risk um, populations. Mm -hmm. um, what are the populations that the health department has identified as at-risk? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, typically it's, you know, young adults and um, folks um, through their 50s or so. So, you know, sort of that young adult to middle age population. Um, I don't know if it's particular demographics, because as you all know, this is sort of uh, a statewide issue. Um, but I can find out from our marketing team, you know, how they identified uh, who this, who's receiving these messages. Um, but they do extensive sort of market research to figure out how to target these messages. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, through a large grant that we have from the CDC called Overdose Data to Action, We've been able to provide community action grants to specific communities that have been um, particularly hard hit with overdoses so that they can um, mobilize local resources to um, address and prevent overdoses. So um, I'm looking to see if I have, I believe it's Rutland, Wyndham, Windsor uh, counties, but I can uh, follow up to see which specific counties, but kind of trying to get money out to community-based organizations so that they can do local outreach and education uh, because they know sort of the, the folks in their community that, um, that they need to reach. So that's been a, a big help. Um, De Deputy Commissioner, this is fabulous information. Um, mm -hmm. Are those grants thanks to federal funds? Um, yes. And um, how did, I mean, and, and are those federal funds going away or how much are those of those federal funds are left so that some other communities could access? Yeah, I don't know how much is left right now, but we expect this grant to continue. Um, it was a five-year grant and I 
believe we are in year three, um, but we expect the grant to continue, particularly given what we're seeing across the country with overdoses. And it's a CDC grant, and um, you know they've been really the ones who have been putting out the information and the data about the overdose crisis. So uh, we expect the funding to continue. Um, so we would certainly. Uh, consider more more grants out to communities through that grant. So, so that's something that you send out to the local districts um, or to, do you send it out to the local um, health department, you know, count, um, or is that something that you somehow? Yeah, I'm sorry. It's to uh, community organizations. So, you know, we would put out sort of an, an RFP and they can apply to get those funds. We targeted in this first round the areas that were really seeing the highest amount of overdoses. So, um, so those may change just given some of the changes we're seeing. Representative would mention Lamoille. So that could be a potential um, area. Uh, Representative Whitman has a question. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Um, just a quick question following up about the community action grants. We actually were awarded some in Bennington as well, and I know that mm -hmm. there's a lot of different initiatives that were sort of based on, I think, specific to communities. And I was wondering if there was gonna be sort of um, a point where different, you know, counties that were awarded these grants could sort of compare notes and come back and see if something could be applied statewide. That's a great, uh, that's a great idea. And actually, one thing that we did during the COVID, well, we're still in COVID, but during the pandemic was we did uh, roundtables across the state and every district, every health department district. Uh, specifically around overdoses and what communities were seeing, what kinds of supports they, um, they might need. And so what we're doing is we're taking all of those roundtable experiences, all of those notes and kind of synthesizing them. And one of the very reasons is so that we can sort of share best practices across the state. And if some communities are, are doing something that they're seeing some success with or just sharing ideas. So I need to loop back and see where that work is now because it's been a little while since we wrapped up the round tables. But when we started really seeing, you know, these overdoses spike, we were like, we need to connect with communities and not only to hear what they're seeing, but also to find out what we might be able to do to, to help. So um, but like I said, another goal was to sort of be able to share best practices across the state. Um, Deputy Commissioner, that's a fabulous idea. Thank you for the question also, um, Representative yeah. Whitman. Um, um, I, think in per I think Royal We, this, co this committee in particular, but probably others would be really um, very interested in that um, synthesis as well. Mm -hmm as it might, um, it, it might suggest some uh, legislative direction or it might suggest some funding mm -hmm. um, kinds of things. Um, um, I, I'm going to ask a question that um, if Representative Brumstead had her hand up, I bet you she would be asking um, because she's our, um, our guru in terms of um, results-based um, and other uh, fun things like that. Uh, you're distributed to grants. When, uh, what kind of um, evaluation or mm -hmm. reporting do the individual communities have? And, and um, is this so new that it's way too early um, for them to be reporting back? I don't believe results? it's, I don't believe it's too early for them to be reporting back and um, and anyone who's received a grant from CDC uh, knows that <laughs> that they do always require an evaluation component and and we would anyway as well because the health department we are 
really data driven and data uh, uh, based. So um, I don't receive those reports directly, but I can certainly go back to the person in the health department who manages that grant and find out what the status of um, those activities are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions for the deputy commissioner around the um, these grants, this 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 initiative? Um, okay, deputy commissioner, we keep. Um, so um, another thing that we got during COVID was there was a SAMHSA um, COVID emergency grant that we received. SAMHSA is the you know, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. So um, that provided um, funding for us uh, to help expand uh, access to services. So like telehealth, being able to provide telehealth services um, through the pandemic, be able to provide that equipment to folks. Um, it also, um, we've been working with um, mental health um, to, uh, so you may be aware of Vermont HelpLink, which is our substance use resource center. It's a website and, and phone number. We were able to um, expand, uh, be able to use Vermont HelpLink to provide mental health linkage to mental health services for healthcare providers. Um, Cause we know that our healthcare providers are um, experiencing high levels of stress and burnout. So we were able to add that to our Vermont Health Link um, service. So um, that's been really helpful to allow, uh, the COVID emergency grant in general has been very helpful to um, be able to keep Remember I said all of our services remained open. That was a big part of that. I already mentioned the MAT and um, SSP co-location project. And um, so we are um, right now, um, the AIDS project of Southern Vermont and Vermont Cares are, um, going to be expanding to have MAT available. And um, the Blueprint for Health and ADAP is working with an organization called Better Life Partners and becoming an office-based opiate treatment program in Vermont. And um, they've developed agreements with syringe service programs and um, so that they're actively receiving referrals so that we can you know, better link people who are accessing SSPs to treatment. So um, like I said earlier, we're really trying to expand that safe recovery model to other SSPs across the state. So stay tuned because there will be more on that in um, 2022. Any questions about that? Um, I'm just curious, uh, Deputy Commissioner, who or what is this group that you that the health department is um, contracting with? They are an org They're an organization out of um, in the Dartmouth area, and um, I can find out more information about them. But they are providing um, opioid treatment services in New Hampshire and uh, along the border. So. Um, I believe that they are connecting with our SSPs along the, in the upper valley so that um, we can better connect people who are accessing services through those SSPs to opioid treatment. And um, I, I'm gonna, um, are these, um, is this a nonprofit? Is this a for-profit? Is this um, a group of, is this a, part of a national corporation? Is this a group of I, providers? What I what, don't um, know the answer to that. Let me, I, I can find out the answer to that. I believe that they're just a, a, um, a private practice, but let me find out for you. Okay. Um, so is this part of the initiative to um, ensure that there is sufficient MAT across the state? 
It's yes, yes. And it is also like I was saying before, when we were talking about SSPs to try to better sort of make MAT sort of uh, connected to um, the SSP system so that people who are actively using and getting services through the SSP have a very easy path into treatment. Okay. That, that helps. So that, um, now just because it's been way too long, when you're talking about MAT, are you talking um, about buprenorphine and methadone or yes. just, okay. Um, yes, but yeah. But at the SSPs, like at Safe Harbor um, and other SSPs, it would be buprenorphine because the to be able to provide methadone, um, you have to be a you know, what we call in Vermont a hub, there are lots and lots and lots of um, federal regulations right. that, and, you know, sort of facility requirements that you have to meet in order to, to provide methadone. So, so these uh, MAT connected with spokes would be buprenorphine. Um, could you refresh our memory as to where exactly are the methadone hubs? Yes, um, they are across the state. Um, let me pull up our directory because I don't wanna leave any of them out. Um, we obviously have them in Burlington. Uh, there is one in St. Albans. There's one in um, Rutland. There is um, up in uh, the Barry area. There is uh, Brattleboro. And how many was that? There are eight. I know there that eight. there are eight. Um, um, and I presume I'm, I'm from Chittenden County. I presume when you say Burlington, you actually South, South, South Burlington. Burlington. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yes. do the hubs um, pro uh, provide both um, methadone and buprenorphine, or are those identified eight eight sites? only providing um, methadone? They, they can provide buprenorphine, but often people who are transitioning to buprenorphine will go to a, a spoke. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. We have mm -hmm. a question. We have a question from Representative Rumstead. Thanks, Madam Chair. I, um, I, I am always interested to hear about expansion of opioid treatment services and hearing more about the um, folks that you're working with in New Hampshire is um, interesting. Mm -hmm. I also, my question I guess is that we have a pretty big motel population of the homeless transit that are involved in the homeless transition programs here in Shelburne. Mm -hmm. And the rescue is overwhelmed by the number of calls they receive at sometimes four times in one hour. And it's mostly, much of it is around the opioid use in the, and I just wonder, are you, is there any specific reaching out? I, I, I definitely heard about the kits and that's mm -hmm. great that they're going to those sites. And is there some training of how to use it at the site? Because I wonder if it's just sitting there um, and how it's, Maybe it should be going to rescue, but it sounds like it's doing that too. Their, yeah. their struggle is what to do if it's not emergency room needed and mm -hmm. how to help the, even how to help the mental health of those who are not, who are just witnessing what's yeah. happening. And so I'm just yeah. Curious. Uh, um, that's a great question. And, you know, we know that that's a huge problem, not only in the, the facility in Shelburne, but also at, you know, many of the motels that are being used to house people who are experiencing homelessness, which is why that was a, a huge um, sort of effort to make sure that these harm reduction packs were getting to the GA motels. Um, as far as training, um, do you mean of the staff or of the residents or? Maybe a little of both because some yeah. places have staff. Some really yeah, don't. Some don't, yeah. You know, yeah. and um, those are the 
that's my concern is like, could you put up a poster that says, you know, on Tuesday, we'll be here to show you show anyone who's interested how to use the materials in this packet or something like that, because I do volunteer at the days in and I've seen the, the boxes mm -hmm. and there's nothing. Um, it's very hard to tell um, if anyone's even opened them. So. Right, right. Uh, that that's a great idea. Let me bring that back because I don't, you know, those, the packs are kind of sort of just drop shipped to all of the places that I mentioned before where they're going. And I don't know how much contact um, the facilities, you know, if they have staff uh, are sort of getting with our ADAP staff. And we could certainly offer to go out and provide, you know, information and training. The materials that are in the harm reduction packs, like there's, like I said, there's naloxone in there and it's, there are instructions that come right with it. So, and it's pretty easy to use, but if folks don't know that it's there or if they're, you know, if they're not getting out there, you know, then, um, then that's, that would be a problem. Um, another thing that reminded me of is that we were working with um, DCF, the Economic Services Division, to establish more recovery or friendly motels, um, one in the Chittenden County area and then another in Rutland. Because, you know, one thing I know, and in my Prior, before I was in this role, I worked for a domestic violence organization in Chittenden County. And, um, you know, there were people that we served who, you know, when our shelter was full, they would go into the general assistance motel program. And one thing that we often heard loud and clear was that they didn't want to go to a particular place because they were in recovery and they knew that there was so much alcohol and drug use in the motel that it would be difficult for them to maintain their um, recovery. And so ADAP worked with ESD to help sort of, you can't really ban substances altogether in a motel setting, but to try to um, really uh, send people with those concerns, like a, have a facility that is um, more tailored toward people who want a substance-free environment. Um, but certainly just given the crunch in housing and the crunch in the motel system, you know, it's probably kind of a drop in the bucket, but at least it was a little bit of an effort. But I'll follow up on the harm reduction packs in the motels and, you know, how we might be able to make those more um, make people more aware of them and also see if, uh, if training would be, uh, if folks would be interested in that. Um, thank you. Representative Small has her hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, going back to something you said earlier in regards to flexibility that the department has created around accessing MAT, are you able to share some of the learning that you've gained through this pandemic as to what that flexibility has allowed in people accessing the services that they need? Yeah, so um, we were able to, and it was in thanks to some relaxation of federal rules that folks were able to, um, and part of the reason at the beginning of the pandemic when we were you know, in lockdown, I don't know if you've ever been to, I know Representative Small, you're in Chittenden County, if you've ever been to the South Burlington um, uh, hub, but in normal times and pre-COVID times, you know, crowds of people you know, showing up and waiting in line to get their methadone, and obviously we couldn't do that during the pandemic, have all those people crowded together. So um, there was expansion of, um, of take home medication. There was also um, delivery. So people were um, providing, delivering people's methadone to their homes. So that was really helpful, particularly if somebody was in isolation or quarantine because of COVID, but, um, and then just the expansion of telehealth, 
um, with MAT, um, which, you know, it's a blessing and a curse because I think that we've seen, we've had some concerns about quality of care, you know, with substance use treatment and telemedicine, but um, for many, it was really a lifesaver. And so we're waiting to see, you know, how, whether some of these relaxation, whether some of the relaxation of these rules will continue post COVID, um, because I think it could really make a big difference for people. And that relaxation is on the federal level, you're saying? Yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And just a follow-up question and thinking about how this is impacting the hubs themselves. Are we seeing increased wait times for folks accessing MAT or are we seeing the opposite as I'm seeing your head shake? Yeah, no, we don't have any sort of waiting list per se. I mean, people, you know, um, but we do know that sometimes it's difficult to access just because of transportation and the rural nature of our state. But if you want access to medication assisted treatment in Vermont, you can, you can get it. You don't have to wait. I mean, you, you need to have sort of an assessment and evaluation. So it's not like I decide right now I want it and I'm just going to show up in South Burlington and, and get it. You, you need to have an assessment and a medical evaluation and all of that, but there isn't like a wait list. So um, Deputy Commissioner, how is that different from the, um, what is available in the emergency room and what is available at, let's say a place like Safe Recovery? Mm -hmm. um, because my, my understanding of the uh, <clears throat> assessment process on the hubs is that can be upwards of three or four days mm -hmm. at the quickest. And so I might say, I appreciate your comment that there's no waiting list. Um, however, for someone who is ready for treatment, three or four days is, is not access to treatment. Right. And, um, right. And so I just want to make the distinction between, um, what I mean by there's no waiting list is that there's capacity in the system to treat any, you know, treat people who need to be treated. It's not like there's a, a list of people who are waiting. Um, but I take your point that it isn't immediate. Um, so we have what we used to call RAM or rapid access to MAT. We're shifting to call rapid treatment access. Um, because we're expanding it to not just opioid treatment, but to any kind of treatment. So, um, so the way that it works is um, three days or less from first point of contact with a treatment provider when an individual, until a, an individual receives their first treatment service. So um, uh, we do have in the emergency department, um, people can be inducted on buprenorphine um, if they present either with an overdose or they present and you know are diagnosed with opioid use disorder. They can be inducted on buprenorphine um, basically to allow them to start to recover or not relapse or not use and potentially overdose again. Um, to tide them over until they can be evaluated at a hub. So, um, and so our goal is to get them connected with the hub within three days. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> I might call it low barrier access through, yes. um, through emergency rooms. Is that same low barrier access what in fact is available through safe recovery that you're trying to expand now? Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, they would have providers available um, there, uh, you know, at the SSP so that when people were ready to access treatment, they could be inducted. Okay. Um, when we talk about the federal rules for methadone and other, um, <clears throat> is there a caseload size? I, I am, um, I am a w aware sort of informally that um, some of the hubs, for instance, the hub in the um, 
Barry area um, that um, counselors have caseloads of 75 to 100 people. Hmm. Um, and so um, I'm, and this is, you know, this is not evidence, this, you know, mm-hmm. this, this is not testimony through the legislature. This is through where we all have friends and family. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I am curious as to what kind of, I, I'm presuming that the health department is, um, has some kind of contract with these or who mm-hmm. is the area of this, you know. And so what kind of oversight is there and expectations in terms of staffing, et cetera? Yeah, that, um, so the hubs um, do work directly with the health department. They're part, of our, they're part of our provider system. And so, you know, they're part of our preferred provider network. And so, you know, they do, we do work with them and there are certain standards that they have to meet. I don't know specifically if there is a caseload sort of um, threshold or a caseload requirement um, at the hubs, but I can certainly um, find that out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, And I want to um, welcome um, two other committee members who um, were able to join us now who weren't able to join us at the beginning, um, Representative Rosenquist and Representative um, Gregoire. Um, And just um, one, um, Deputy Commissioner, I'm not sure how much more you have for us, but just to let the um, folks know, we, uh, the Deputy Commissioner is walking through some of the initiatives um, that the department is, um, has been doing during the pandemic to address uh, the continuing um, opioid crisis and opioid deaths. And the way we've been doing it, as she's gone through each initiative, we've stopped and asked her questions. And um, she's gone through quite a few. um, And so it's been fascinating and we keep interrupting her. (laughs) Fine. (laughs) Um, um, Deputy Commissioner, um, you have, gone through sort of the grants and some of that, what else, um, what, what have we not asked you or what other initiatives have you not talked to us about? I have two more that I'd like okay. to highlight. And one is um, we've expanded the recovery coaches and emergency departments. So we have um, recovery coaches who are either on call or who have scheduled shifts in 13 hospitals across the state. And I believe that we're gonna hit the 14 um, this year. And so the idea um, around that, and this this helps with um, that wait time that you were talking about, uh, Representative Pugh, because what, what happens is if somebody presents to the emergency department, either with an overdose or with another substance related issue, or if it comes to light during another type of visit, um, recovery coaches will come and meet with that person and sort of, they're either people who are in recovery themselves or people who are interested in recovery services who've gone through special training to be a recovery coach. And so they will partner with that person, connect them with recovery services, and they will stay in touch with them every day until the person accesses treatment. And so we've made this available in hospitals all but one across the state. And so um, that's been huge. And we've gotten a lot of positive feedback about this program. And so it's great to to have seen it expand during the pandemic. when people really needed it. So I'll so, pause and see if there are any questions about that. Um, uh, <clears throat> Deputy Com- uh, Commissioner, in the expansion, um, did that um, mean that the recovery centers individually got additional resources from the state to enable them to staff the hospitals? Yes, I believe they have. There are some that um, the coaches are on call and some that are actually like physically have shifts in the hospitals, but we did provide extra support to the recovery centers for this initiative. Um, And they have also just 
I've really praised the uh, the connections that they've been able to make through this program. So it's been it's been wonderful. Um, wonderful. Um, Representative McFawn has a question. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Well, I'm I'm interested in the recovery coach uh, in the hospital and uh, staying in touch every day with somebody until they get treatment. Um, these people that we're talking about, because I, I, thought, I thought you said if they come there and they're for an overdose, if, if they're not ready to get treatment, then having this person in contact with them every day, is, is that to try to convince them that they well, should get treatment? Or, uh, I'm, 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 I can just see somebody in this situation calling every day or meeting them in person for nothing, if they're not right. Ready. You raise a good point that, um, you know, people have to be ready um, for treatment. So it's certainly voluntary for them to engage with the recovery coach. So, you know, they're certainly not going to force themselves on them if the person says thanks, but no thanks then they'll give them some information and, um, and sort of be on their way. But, you know, I think making that personal connection, at least, you know, even if it's just that one time is important because it shows them that, Hey, there's, there's, a, here's a connection point and there are people out there, you know, maybe the person, maybe the recovery coach themselves had been in their shoes and can share their personal experience. And so it's a connection point. So they would give them information and, and um, but they certainly wouldn't, uh, if the person refused, then they would, they would back off. Thank you. Um, thank you. We have um, a lineup of questions, um, Representative Noyes and then Representative Whitman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just, um, you had talked about it being between one to three days for access to MAT. And I was wondering if you're tracking that, like how many are, how many people are one day, how many are two, how many are three? And then along the same lines with the recovery coach, um, once somebody makes that initial interaction with an individual, um, are you, what's going on with like the next step kind of inpatient treatment centers or detox facilities? Are you know what the wait times are there um, and are there supports both um, in our more urban areas and also uh, more rural areas as we were talking about um, with Lamoille County having a very high um, mm -hmm. overdose rate right now. Thank you. Yeah, so we do have recovery centers across the state. So um, there are 12 throughout the state. So there are those services available. As far as residential treatment, you know, we do have three residential treatment facilities in the state of Vermont. Um, and so uh, people can, you know, obviously access those. They, it's, you know, it's been a little challenging for our residential treatment system, particularly during COVID. Um, you know, they've had outbreaks, you know, over and over in their facilities, they've been able to make some changes so that it doesn't shut down admissions and they can sort of quarantine and isolate people when they first come in. Um, but it does, you know, uh, you know, the residential treatment system is not an emergency. It's not like going to an emergency room. It's not really intended to be, um, you know, like a same day admission. So even if there are beds available, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm gonna, you know, if I decide today I wanna go to residential treatment, I may be able to get in the same day, but it really depends on, you need to be medically cleared to go to a residential treatment facility because, you know, it's, it's not a hospital. So if you have significant uh, like co-occurring medical conditions or other things, you know, you really need to be evaluated before you go to a residential treatment facility. And if you um, are on methadone, it takes some time for the residential facility to set up what's called guest dosing. So they work with their local hub to be able to get the methadone that they need for a particular patient. So that might take, you know, a, a day or two to, to get set up. 
So there are a few things at play that affect um, how quickly somebody can get into a residential treatment facility. Thank you, and Representative Whitman. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, quick question, um, and I guess it's a bit leading. Um, in uh, Bennington, I know one of our community action grants uh, included recovery coaches accompanying EMS for um, emergency calls, like two motels, and you know, in the case of an mm -hmm. overdose where EMS needed to respond. Um, are any other counties uh, doing that kind of uh, partnership? I believe there is one or two other places that are doing that, but I don't know off the top of my head where that is, but I can certainly find that out. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Representative Whitman, just because I'm keeping notes, can you clarify what the question was you asked? Well, and this might kind of uh, be a follow up from my last question as well. Um, there are um, in Bennington, one of our community action grants was um, a partnership between recovery coaches and our emergency um, medical services. So whenever there's a call for um, uh, overdose uh, where emergency medical services will uh, go out to respond, they'll be recovered by a recovery coach similar to what we're seeing in emergency rooms. And my question was, uh, to what extent those are uh, implemented throughout the state? Is it just Bennington County or other counties? And I guess the follow-up would be, um, you know, what are the results um, from that? What's the sort of evaluation of the effectiveness of the program? But yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Deputy Commissioner, I believe you said you had, had uh, one more that you yeah, want to make sure we knew about. Yeah, I actually touched on it earlier, but it's Vermont Health Link, which was launched in March of 2020, coincidentally, um, just as the, the world was shutting down. And it's been a great resource for um, people to either uh, get a referral to treatment or just to get information about substance use issues, about um, accessing treatment or recovery services. And um, the one thing that we heard loud and clear, particularly when the Opioid Coordination Council was still active, was that when a family member of someone who was suffering with substance use or the person themselves were ready to access treatment, like they didn't know what to do or where to go. And so, you know, you just start like Google searching. And, um, and so this provides a one, one-stop shop, uh, a single phone number, a single website where people can um, people can call the number and get a referral. You know, get connected directly to a treatment provider in their area so that they can be assessed and find out what level of treatment um, they need. And so uh, we've had um, over uh, almost sixty thousand visits to the website. And we've had almost 2,000 calls um, just in 2021. And then since, it, since its inception, there's been over 4,000 referrals to treatment or recovery services through Vermont Health Link. So um, we've seen it continue to grow. And um, I just want to make sure that you're aware of that resource. Um, thank you, Deputy Commissioner. And as you were talking about it, I... Um, pulled it up on my iPad mm -hmm. um, and it seems very, um, very accessible to me. Mm -hmm. And it is in English and it um, requires, um, I guess it, it assumes access to the internet and it assumes um, a mobile, a mobile device. It actually um, is, there's also, you can access it by phone. So you can either call the number or use the website. And if you call the phone and you need interpreter services, those are available uh, through the phone number. Um, I, I, I know nothing about <laughs> this kind of web stuff, but there might be helpful if somewhere on the website 
there was something about if I if you have no idea what these words mean, where you can go. Because last I knew in Burlington, and I don't live in Burlington, but there were 26 plus languages spoken in the high school. Yeah. Um, um, Deputy Commissioner, this has been very um, helpful and very um, informative. Um, and I, I very much, um, I think, speak for the committee for your um, appreciation for your going through this. I am wondering, and it is fine um, if you do not, um, if you at all can speak to um, what is in the BAA budget adjustment. And if not, yeah. There are no policy um, issues related to ADAP and the BAA, so there's really nothing to speak to um, on that. But there is one other thing I'd like to just bring your awareness to, and I'm sure it's not going to be a surprise if that's okay if I uh, say one more thing. But the biggest challenge that we have right now in the substance use treatment world is workforce we are really, really struggling. And so it's no surprise, you know, all, all providers are struggling and so many sectors are struggling, but we just, particularly in the outpatient system and in our residential system, the hubs and the spokes are doing okay, but um, our residential treatment providers are, you know, paying for traveling nurses. They've had trouble keeping people, We've been assisting them with um, paying the difference between what they would normally pay their nurses and what they're paying for travelers because it's like a huge discrepancy. But particularly in the outpatient system, um, our providers are just really struggling to uh, get and retain staff. And it's, it's impacting the availability of outpatient treatment services. So I just want to put that on your radar. Um, just um, thank you for putting that on our radar, um, Deputy Commissioner, uh, so that we are all, so that we have the same understanding and are talking about the same workforce. Who are you talking about? The example that you gave was nurses, and yeah. then you talked about outpatient. So yeah. um, when you talk about providers, are you? talking about nurses and nurses only? Are you talking about um, substance use professionals who are licensed to provide outpatient treatment? Um, so when, so if you could explain. Yeah, so it's really across, across the board. So nurses have sort of been in the spotlight because, you know, they're such a hot commodity and because so many are leaving their employment and then signing up for to be a traveler and then basically being assigned back to their same place to make you know a lot more money. Um, so so that's certainly an issue, but we're seeing it across the board in um, in uh, you know for milieu staff in the residential treatment facilities for you know counseling staff um, in our outpatient programs it's really been a challenge. Thank you. Um, I guess I have two questions for you. Um, one, um, just to edify myself, what is it that the nurses do um, as, as contrasted to physicians or um, nurse practitioners or PAs? And um, what is it that they do differently than outpatient um, therapists or residential providers? So in the residential treatment, um, in a residential treatment facility, particularly if somebody is um, going through detox or withdrawal, you know, there's a medi medical management component to that. So the nurses are really, I'm speaking about nurses really mostly for the residential system. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, and my second question is, um, where will we see this in the budget adjustment? 
um, if this is a if this is a problem, and mm -hmm. one of the ways the um, department has been responsive to the community need is to provide whatever the difference between right. regular and that for nurses. Um, now I'm wondering what, in fact, ideas um, or have have you been doing for the other professionals who work in there? And so where do we see that in the budget adjustment? Because I presume that wasn't anticipated in the budget we passed. Yeah, so um, there will be something in the home and community based service um, through DIVA through the their budget adjustment for um, retention and sign on bonuses for uh, staff in the substance use treatment system, as well as um, a rate increase. So, um, but that's and that not is and, and that is for all the providers or only the medical providers. Um, I believe it's for all the providers. You, um, so, I, I so, wish we were in. I wish we were in the committee room because um, what I'm seeing is a crinkled forehead, which, <laughs> which, um, which I interpret as, but you're not sure. You're right. And um, if we were in committee room, there'd be someone sitting next to you going, I can find this out for you quickly. Um, but if you could just confirm that for us, that would be great. Um, and now that we've opened up that question, um, we have a, a, a question from Representative McFawn, followed by a question from Representative Whitman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my, my question uh, is the money that is going out to the community action agencies, does that go directly or does it go through the State, of, uh, state Office of Economic Opportunity? I'm not sure I know which money to the community action agencies you're speaking of. Um, it was. It, I, I thought you said that you were sending money out uh, through it was, community action agencies um, because they knew who um, might be using. And I guess it was th those kits. Yeah, I apologize. What I said was community action grants. It wasn't to the community action agencies. Oh, oh okay. I apologize for the miscommunication. Community action grants, okay. Um, and Representative Whitman. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Deputy Commissioner, just wanna start by saying thank you so much for all of the work and the initiatives um, that you've described. Um, just wanted to ask one other um, component, kind of the flip on the workforce issue is looking at what are the sorts of, um, how is employment uh, seen as a part of treatment or um, what are the collaborations between the Department of Labor, uh, vocational rehab? And I guess as well, like, is there any evidence to suggest that um, employment has an effect on relapse or anything like that? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And that's something that we did have an employment and recovery services pilot uh, that uh, is sort of being re looked at um, with voc rehab. Um, we didn't see a tremendous amount of success with that pilot, but it also could be confounded by, um, you know, COVID happening, you know, sort of in the midst of it. Um, but certainly there's been a lot of work around sort of recovery friendly workplaces. And, you know, there was some steam around that pre COVID that we're, you know, looking to uh, sort of rejuvenate because there are um, employers out there who've really embraced hiring people in recovery. And we know that sort of like having a sense of purpose and a, you know, connection with other people is hugely important um, for folks in recovery. So that's definitely something that is still on our radar and that, um, that we're gonna be connecting with um, Voc Rehab on because it is, it is important. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And actually part of our stigma campaign that's running right now, I don't know if anyone has seen it, there's a, uh, a media campaign around stigma and substance use. And one of the spots 
um, is actually an employer talking about hiring people in recovery. Deputy Commissioner, am I making this up, which I could be, but um, isn't there some federal, um, from time to time, um, don't business, uh, can't a business access some federal support when they hire people with disabilities and a person in recovery um, might be um, identified as a person with a disability if they have an alcohol substance use or mental health issue. So, I mean, I, that's my understanding is that- Yeah, you know, is, yeah, I, I, yeah I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm gonna have to look into that. Okay. I, feel, I think you're right. I don't know if, if any of our employers here in Vermont have been using that for people in recovery. Um, I mean, if, if I haven't made this up, which is always a possibility, um, <laughs> you know, that might be, um, something to encourage. Um, uh, you talk about and um, how uh, the department is going to connect with VOC Rehab or no, Department of Labor. Is that what it is? The Department of Labor with this um, employment issue? It was VOC Rehab. Oh, with VOC Rehab. Yeah. So, um, so the um, the the uh, the pilot or the grant was not renewed, and we are now six months plus um, since it has not been remo um, renewed. So in that six month period, what has been the connection and outreach between the Voc Rehab and the recovery centers? My apologies. For some reason, when I use Zoom, my audio cuts out. So I heard okay. at six months and then it went Nothing. dead. That's so can you repeat fine. the question? Um, sure. Um, it really has to do with the decision, um, which I understand had something to do with finances. Um, mm -hmm. I could be wrong. And so curious as to how much um, that really, how much of an impact on the Department of Health's budget that is or not. Um, but that at one point, you there was a pilot um, to use um, people who were in recovery to coach and otherwise connect with um, employment opportunities. Mm -hmm. You said that the, the the results weren't what people were looking for, but maybe that was compounded or confounded by um, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And my understanding of the reason there was the pilot was because the initial connection to the Department of um, Folk Rehab hadn't been very successful. So they were trying something new. We're, we've gone back to the um, Folk Rehab. In the six months since we have not been funding um, the pilot, what has been the outreach and connection between Voc Rehab and the recovery centers? I think that it has not come to fruition yet, but it's something that we've been talking about internally. So what has happened to the money that um, was saved by not renewing the pilot? I will have to get back to you on that. I do not know. Thanks. Uh, Uh, Deputy Commissioner, this has been very, um, very helpful in um, both a review and, 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 and not a review, in fact, giving us information. Um, because as you started out, you said the state has been experiencing what many would call two, two pandemics or two um, crises, two public health crises, mm -hmm. one um, COVID-19 and um, the other the uh, increase in um, opioid addiction and deaths. And um, you've outlined sort of things that we have, that the department is um, moving forward on and um, what we would be interested in. You've said that there's no, um, there's no policy changes in the BAA. I think we'd be interested and in if you could come back to us with that, with any kind of ups, um, and you know how 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 is the state 
how is how are we funding some of these new initiatives that we did not or the expansion of the initiatives that when we were perhaps more hopeful last year when we passed mm-hmm. a budget and we didn't think some things would need to um, happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. My understanding um, is that you were you're going to come back to uh, um, and you can do it in. Um, in writing, or if you think it's easier to come back in person, let me know. Okay. Uh, um, that uh, sort of some of the things that we were asking for is um, who are you targeting the messages to and what languages um, in terms of outreach um, that uh, um, sort of... <clears throat> The grant results mm-hmm. um, for those uh, that I guess we are the sub we um, we get the CDC grant and we then push them out to the communities um, that you were going to look to see if there was um, any federal or state requirements or expectations around caseload size mm-hmm. or um, the hubs in terms of that. Um, and uh, sort of how widespread or not, what I want to say is the Bennington model um, for for recovery um, coaches or whatever and EMS and that, um, that, um, and that I wrote down DIVA for something. That was the home and community-based services um and, and the and, retention the and the retention and, retention and just a clarification or a confirmation that this um that the workforce targeting is for um work for an inclusive workforce not solely it, nurses yeah i actually virtually had someone whisper in my ear <laughs> that it is all <laughs> oh, that is all okay then we got that one all answered um um from 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 uh, I think it is important in terms of um, educating um, or informing the body, the legislative body, as well as um, the public, um, that when we are talking about workforce issues, as we as it relates to substance use disorder, opioid addiction, and um, uh, medical um, and others, is that we are not that we are talking about workforce, not just people with a medical degree. Right. And um, that's the, that's the, that's what we keep hearing about is nurses Mm -hmm. and doctors. And um, Mm -hmm. it's more, unfortunately, it's more widespread um, than that. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, I really, um, Deputy Commissioner, really, um, again, appreciate, appreciate, and if you would pass on to your staff, appreciate the work that they've been doing Mm -hmm. um, in trying to do their jobs and then in doing other duties as assigned um, and um, appreciate the fact that so much of our work in this state around substance um, use disorder and, um, and especially as it relates to opiate is based on science and based on best practice and what the literature and research says is what is um, effective. So um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Nice to see you all. uh, Nice to see you. Um, Committee, if we could take a um, a, a, a 10 minute break and then come back for just a, this is what the rest of the week looks like and this is where we're going forward and to talk a little bit about what to expect as we have five days to provide feedback to um, the Appropriations Committee. So we will be doing it a little differently than perhaps we did it last year.